we actually got uh, another stirring in our spirit, and that stirring was uh, for the campuses here in our region, high school campuses to be exact. While I was doing youth ministry, I was getting this feeling, and, and, and I believe God, uh, he talks about seasons uh, in the Bible, and I believe I felt like my season was coming to end on a, on a, in a local uh, church youth ministry, and God opened a door with an organization called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And so FCA approached me, and basically what we do is we go to high school campuses, and preach the gospel, and we use the influence of athletes to do that. So we bring in former and current professional athletes to share their testimony. Uh, we'll use a classroom, we'll use a theater, we'll use a gymnasium, and we do that on all the major high schools in, in Elk Grove, Galt, Lodi. We're just now getting into Stockton. Uh, it's also uh, Otis Amy who came and spoke at the football breakfast. Uh, he's with uh, uh, FCA as well. And we've been seeing God do an amazing thing. In last year alone, in the Elk Grove region, we saw over 1,000 kids give their lives to Christ. I mean, I think you should be excited about that. That's, that's awesome. That's, those are the kids that everybody's given up on. Those are the kids that nobody said would uh, ever, ever give their lives to the Lord. And while, the gen while people are writing off this next generation, I'm here to prophesy that they're the generation the Lord's been waiting on. They're the generation that everybody says, you know, they never amount to anything. They're distracted. They've got all these things. But it's when... When we are in the darkest season of, our, of spirituality is when God raises up the brightest lights and he uses young people, he uses a generation to shift an entire culture. And I believe that we're starting. I'm not prophesying there is a move of God. I'm saying it's already begun. And it's happening in the campuses all over this region. It's in Natomas High School. It's in, in Sakai. It's happening. Kennedy, all over the place. God is moving by his spirit. What he said 2,000 years ago is still happening. When it began, what, how the church began was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and as it began to get poured out, the Bible says that these men and women, these, these followers of Christ, what happened? They began to pray in a room, and all of a sudden, I, it was a room about this size, I bet, and all of a sudden, the Bible says the wind began to blow, and the sound of a mighty rushing wind, the sound of heaven filled where they were at, and everything changed from that moment. They began to, they began to feel the, fi the firepower of the Holy Spirit, which makes following Christ so much better. Let me tell you, if you haven't been introduced to, the, to walking in the Spirit, let me tell you, today's your day. Because there's no better way to follow Christ than following Him, being Spirit-led. It's the way we have to do things. It's what birthed the church. It's the reason why we are sitting here today, is that 100 years ago in L.A., there was a mighty move of God that filled a small church, and the wind began to blow again. The wind began to blow, and all of these believers started to gather, and they started to pray, and they started to seek God, and then everything changed in a moment. I still believe that that one touch of heaven can change everything. I still believe, you can call me old school, uh, I believe in classes and, and going to, to certain things, but I believe that one touch from Jesus can change your life forever because one touch from Jesus changed my life forever. I remember living a, a, a duplistic lifestyle and I was trying to, I was playing the games pastor, I was doing everything Right, I would attend church Sunday, but I had no real desire to, to serve God. I was running. And I was the Luke 15 prodigal son running from the Lord. I knew the lingo. I knew how to write, you know, put the good face on it. And then all of a sudden, one day as I'm driving home from a camping trip, Jesus showed up. You know why he showed up? It's because I called his name. Just like the song we were singing, What a Beautiful Name, it's the only name by which men could be saved. I called out to the name Jesus because I, I took inventory of my own life and I said, God, Look, I know I'm not serving you. I know I'm not fully committed. I know I haven't answered the call that's on my life. But if you can give me, if you can set me free from these addictions, from this pain, from this lifestyle, just chasing everything that leads me to destruction, that leads me to emptiness, I'll serve you 100%. Because I've grown up in church, I've seen the difference with one foot in and one foot out. I know the difference. And I said, God, I'll give you everything. And I don't even know what I'm signing up for. And so when, in one instant, I was, I was instantly set free. And tears began to flow down my cheeks that I had suppressed from years and years, pushing away God, just pushing him away, saying, I don't want this. I don't need you. And then in an instant, everything changed in my life. I found myself born again, again. I found myself experiencing a spiritual awakening. Maybe that's what's going to happen for some of you here today. Maybe God drew you into this room. Maybe God brought you here. Maybe it was a friend, or maybe you've been a regular and tender for years, but God wants to touch you today. Let me tell you, friends, one touch from heaven, it can change everything. Just ask the woman who was stuck in the same cycle for 12 years. The Bible says that she was bleeding for 12 years. She was stuck in the same cycle. She was losing blood for 12 years, and there's life in the blood. The Bible says that she was losing life for 12 years, and as she was passing through a crowd, she saw Jesus. 
She saw the one that could set her free. She was so desperate enough to reach out and touch Jesus. And now all of a sudden, everybody was touching Jesus. But there was something different about this touch. There was this touch of faith. There was this reaching out saying, God, if you could do, if you could just do what I've heard that you've been doing for others, if you'll do it for me. And she didn't even have words. She didn't say, hey, Jesus, can you come to my house? Can you strangely, you know, make things happen? All of a sudden, she just touched him. And then all of a sudden, Jesus stopped. Whoa. Who just touched me? His disciples are like, hey, hey, what are you talking about? Who touched you? You're just walking through a crowd of people. Is this another parable? Are you going to tell us something that we don't know? I, I don't understand. Like, who touched you? I don't get it. No, he's like, I just felt healing. I just felt virtue. Something was released out of my body. Can I tell you? Jesus is here right now. If you would just reach up and touch him, he will set you free for the things that have been plaguing you, from the loss of sleep, from the anxiety, from the depression. One touch from Jesus is all it takes. And he stopped and said, hey, this woman had spent all of her coin on her condition. The Bible says she spent all of her money trying to get better, and she only got worse. Can I tell you, Jesus is always the answer. He was 2,000 years ago, and he still is today. Jesus is what we need. We need a revival and awakening of Jesus coming back into our lives, being the sole focus, being the air that we breathe, the song that we sing. Hallelujah. All right. Amen. Yes, we do. Well, uh, I'm... Really excited to be here, whatever all that was about. Praise the Lord. We just flow. I love the Holy Spirit. I, was, uh, I just love how he, uh, he shows up and, and comes, and we were singing earlier. Sometimes songs prophesy kind of the direction of, of how a sermon is going to go. And I, when, I, when I hear the, the words that we were singing, I, you know, like, God, show us your glory. And I'm like, Lord, and I'm sitting there crying, just like, Lord, let this not be a song. But let this be the theme of our lives, Lord. And, and Moses, the Bible says, when he would go and spend time face to face with God, he was on a mountain, and the, the radiant presence of the Lord was swirling around the mountain. It, it was a, the appearance of fire. It was the fire of God literally on a mountain. And when he came off the mountain, the Bible says his face began to glow. You know, Mo had too much glow. And so they had to put like a sheet over him, you know, and he's glowing. But then Paul says that there's a greater glory now. There's a greater glory that's in us that we are now, we are, we are carriers of this presence, you know, the Holy Spirit. I can't wait to get to heaven because when I get to heaven, I'm going to go up to Moses. I'm going to go, hey, Mo, tell me about that glow. Tell me about, you know, like parting the Red Sea with that stick, you know, whew. you know, Moses, tell me, or I'm going to go to David. I'm like, David, what was it like, you know, when you got all of, all of the army of Israel over here cowarding and afraid and you come up with a little rock and a rag and, whew, and take out Goliath, you know, and then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go up to Samson. I'm going to talk to Samson. I'm going to like, were your biceps really that big, you know? And so I'm going to like have all these things. And then, you know, I was like, and what was it like, Samson, when the spirit of the Lord came upon you, you know, and you would do these and, and they're all three going to stop and they're going to like, Jared, Jared, no, 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 tell us, tell us what it was like to have God living on the inside of you. What was it like to have the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead inside of you? Tell us what it was like that every day you got to have the power and the presence of God on the inside of you. Tell me what it was like walking in it every single day, fulfilling your purpose on the earth that for years and years it was prophesied there was coming the helper. And Jesus kept saying that the Holy Spirit would come. Tell us what it was like. You began to carry the spirit of God. And that's for all of us. We are the temples. We're the carriers of the presence of God. And we go. We go and we, it's, it's like this river. We're talking about the river and the songs, you know. And, and, it, and it's just, it's like the river of life. that We used to sing a song back in the day called, There's a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Oh, something opens doors, says the captain. <laughs> that was the first time I ever tried to sing a song, okay? I'm, I'm a preacher, not a singer, but praise the Lord. I'm, hallelujah. If it sounded anything like a song, it's the anointing. All right. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's the problem, or that's, that's what I really feel like God had asked me to come and deliver a message is, is um, one of my greatest prayers that I've always been praying is like, God, would you send an awakening to our church, to the church, you know, our, our Western church, God, would, would you send an awakening? Would you send something that, that you know, when, when he shows up, like, like he ruins our business plans. He ruins our, our daily activities. Like he comes and he disrupts everything. And we can no longer just do church and life as usual. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, God, do it, do it in my life. And, I, and I, I saw what happened in the book of Acts. You know, the book of Acts, if you, if you read the beginning, 
If you're taking notes, you should read Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5. No, I'm just kidding. I just, yeah, just read the book of Acts. It's a great, great, it's a great, um, it's a great pattern to follow of what happens when God sends an awakening to the church. And so as, as the disciples, as they get filled with this power, the Bible says that they begin to speak in languages that nobody ever taught them. Like there was this evidence that they were being filled with this supernatural power, the thing that they had been waiting for. And they, they had no idea what was coming was this power to make them bold witnesses on the earth. And, and here's, here's the cool thing is as the power of God fills them, the Holy Spirit, and they be, all begin to speak in different languages that nobody had ever taught them. It's interesting, like there was people from all different ethnicities present. And while they were all around from different backgrounds, Maybe you have a different background than the neighbor next to you. Maybe you come from a different place. Maybe you, maybe you guys aren't friends or something. But here's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit unites a group of people. And so as their, mess, as their languages were different, the Bible says the message was the same. They were all glorifying God. They were all praising Him. So if we want a fresh shot pouring, you know what's going to do? It's going to unify us as a body of believers. And I love how Pastor prays for all the other churches because he knows if we're really going to see a move of the Spirit like we've been waiting for, we've been asking God for, that would not just influence us and infect us, but it would affect our kids, our grandkids, our neighbors, our co workers, then everything would begin to change and it will bring a sense of unity that while we may be speaking different languages, our message is always the same. It's a message of hope. It's a message of healing and deliverance and salvation. That's what we've came on the earth to do. We came to be his representatives and his ambassadors. I love, I love what happens is because right after that, that takes place and, and Peter gets up in Acts 2 and he preaches this, this powerful message and Peter was the coward. You remember, Peter was the one that denied Jesus three times. He was just afraid. But the Holy Spirit turned Peter from a coward into this roaring lion who was so bold, who was so unafraid of the people that he was once running from. All of a sudden, he turns to them, and they took notice. Aren't these guys just like ordinary men? That's what's so encouraging to all of us, that God can use us, ordinary people, that just, to just say yes to him, and everything can change. And so as, as they start to move forward, into normal life, and this is where I want to kind of land this morning, is like, what does it mean to be, you know, uh, a believer in normal life? You know, so many times our, our Christianity uh, is kind of based on the church that we attend, you know, our, our lifestyle and, and our preferences and everything like that. But the church has never been meant to just be contained in this, in this building we call a church. It's meant to be like a virus that gets out and spreads everywhere. It spreads to your coworkers. It spreads to your family. And it's a good contagious virus. It's the virus of the kingdom of God. Jesus said that this kingdom is spreading, and it's, it's spreading like violence, and, and, the, and the men that take a hold of it, it's pressure. I was just telling my son the other day, he had a soccer game, and I said, son, we should pray before your soccer game, you know, and he's like, oh, I don't know, dad, I'm nervous. I said, son, it's a perfect opportunity for you to step past the pressure of this culture that's that antichrist spirit that's warring against us to keep us silent to keep us contained to put us in a box step up son and start to influence those around you that's what the kingdom of god is all about we are salt and light of this world and that's what we have to do so my son we got all of the team together and we don't know what their backgrounds are but we said hey we're gonna pray who wants to lead the prayer this morning? And they, they're kind of like, we're going to pray? Oh, my gosh, can we do this? And the other coach is like, is this okay? Is parents going to say anything? I'm not going to pray. Would somebody volunteer? And then there goes Noah's hand up right there. And then Noah prays a prayer. He says, God, I just thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this game. I thank you for what you're going to do. Protect all of us, both teams, Lord, but help us get the W. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. <laughs> It's a good prayer to pray because we did. We got the W. And you know what it said to the rest of his team members? Wow. That prayer worked. Who knows if that one little seed could spark something in an entire generation? Who knows? Do you know how strategic you are to the people around you? That it's not an accident that you are here. I remember one day, and I was driving home in between uh, youth service, uh, or in between working and going to a youth service. And, and usually on Wednesday nights, we would have our youth service. And so like right around 4.30, there was this little window of time that I could run home. And then I could, you know, go home, 
eat dinner with my wife and then run back before, you know, worship and pre-service prayer started and all those different things. And, and I remember, like, I'm not going today. And then my wife texts me, hey, I need you. I need you to pick up some dinner, bring it to the kids. It's so-and-so sick. And I'm like, I don't have time for this woman. I'm a man of God, and I have to prepare for tonight's message. And, the, and then the Father in heaven's like, you are my child, and you're going to take care of the wife I gave you and all those beautiful children because that's your first, foremost priority, son. And I was like, oh, hallelujah. Thank you for the reminder. And so I get into my car, and I start driving, and I'm, I'm, I'm rushing as fast as I can, and I look at my, have you ever gambled with the gas light before? Oof. I saw that thing, and I was just like, in my mind, I had a split second of like running out of gas on the freeway, having to call my wife because I'd be embarrassed to call anybody else. Can you come get gas? Put the kids in the car. I know they're sick. And I was like, okay, I get gas. So I run over to AMPM on Grant Line Road right there, and I was like, run in. I'm like, it's just 20 bucks in there. Get out. And then I'm, like, I'm sitting there, and, and I'm just pumping, you know, like, Come on, hurry up, you know, like, it's because all these people out here, you know, it's slowing down the pumps, you know, and I'm just impatient, not in the fruit of the spirit, but the fruit of the flesh, and I'm just like wearing it like it's a good fit, and I'm just pumping, 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 and then a guy next to me goes, hey, those are cool shoes, man, I like those, and I'm like, ah, thank you so much, and, you know, just like, and, and then he goes, hey, uh, the reason I like those shoes is because they're flat-soled like that, you know, and he goes, I got uh, no arch in my feet, so I have to wear flat-soled uh, shoes. If I, if I wear shoes with an arch, I get... Uh, severe headaches and, and back pain and different things. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. He's like, yeah, I got them from H&M and everything like that. And sh- 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 all right, hey, have a good day. And, sh- 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 and I get about right there. And the Holy Spirit's like, you know why that guy was talking to you, right? And I was like, oh, no, God, I got to get home, take care of the wife, you know, and the children. <laughs> He's like, I got another assignment for you. You just got to go back and, and pray that his back and his headaches would go away so he could wear any shoe he wants. So I was like, oh. Okay. So I like back up, reverse, you know, I get over there. I was like, hey, sir, we're going to talk a little bit slower. Hey, sir, um, couldn't help but to overhear how you were talking about how you're, you're having headaches and back pain because of the, of the arch that is not in your foot. He's like, uh, I said, is it okay if I pray for you? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. So I come over and reach around the, you know, the, I'll come over and I'm like, hey, and so I was like, I'll oh, just put my, uh, so I start to pick my hand out, and he grabs my hand like this, and he, you know, holds it like that, like an arm wrestling. I was like, oh, okay, this is good. I haven't learned this one, but I'm going to use this one. Father, I just thank you. Uh, what's your name? Dave. Father, I just thank you for Dave. I just thank you for his life. Thank you for uh, just this moment of encountering you, Lord. I just command healing into his body. In Jesus' name, I command pain to go. And I just pray for the arch in his feet to come back. Can I touch your feet? He's like, yeah, so I just touch his feet real quick. Command arch in Jesus' name to go. Amen. And I'm turning away to walk away. And he grabs my arm and goes like this. <laughs> Pulls me into his chest and he goes, now I'm going to pray. I said, yes, you are going to pray. <laughs> And he says, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this brother. I'm like, man, this guy's praying. I thank you for this brother that reminded me today of the call that's on my life that I've been running from you ever since my dad died of cancer. Father, I just thank you that I'm coming back today. I'm going to get into my word, and I'm going to fulfill the call that's always been on my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. That's a good place to clap for the church right there. He goes, you got to meet my wife. I look over, his wife's just bawling her eyes out. He's got two beautiful children in his, in his car, and, and she's just like, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm crying. I'm like, oh, man, I was just, I'm supposed to get gas and leave. And, and, uh, and it just, you know, as I'm driving away, I'm, I, you know, I just thought about, you know, how these holy interruptions are not just interruptions, but they're strategic things. Uh, assignments that God has on every one of our lives, especially when it doesn't fit our calendar, especially it doesn't fit our task list. But this is exactly what the disciples went into a life of. You know, the Bible says in Acts 3 and 4, they are now heading to the place of prayer. They're going back to normal life, filled with this power. They're going back, have this, this huge awakening, this, this promised spirit, the paraclete, the helper had come and empowered them. And now they're going back, Acts 3 and 4, and they're walking by. And all of a sudden, they said there was a man who was lame since birth. And I don't know how he missed Jesus. I don't know how he missed the Messiah Crusades. I don't know how he didn't get healed, but he didn't get healed when Jesus was walking and talking and breathing and moving through the cities. The Bible says that Jesus healed all that were brought to him, and as they passed by him, the man, I don't know what the man's situation was, and I don't know if he called out to God that morning saying, God, would you ever see me? Would you ever heal me? Would you ever do a miracle for me? But this man, the Bible says, reaches out and asks for money. 
And now the disciples, you, you could imagine, well, we're, we're, we're late for church. Well, we're late because it's the time of prayer. We, we don't have money. And, and instead, they just remembered, oh, what are we supposed to do? What did Jesus teach us to do? They walked past him, and they said, stop. They said, look at us. And he said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the Bible says the man springs to his feet. And he began to run around and shout. And he was in excitement. And then, then, the, then the religious community was in an uproar. Like, how could you do this? How could you heal this man? And what, by what power did you do this? You know, see, that's what happens when, when, when we allow the Holy Spirit to disrupt our lives. It causes interruption and disruption to the kingdom of darkness, to the kingdom of this age. This antichrist spirit doesn't know what to do. The, the religious community didn't have a scripture they could point him to saying, well, this wasn't on the Sabbath. You know, they didn't have nothing to do. Instead, they persecute the believers and say, don't, do not no longer preach in this name. Oh, what a great day it is when you start to have persecution on your job. What a great day it is when you start to get persecuted because of your belief, because of your families. They're, they're coming against you. What a great privilege it is to be persecuted. It is a, it, we are, they celebrate and said, oh, after they were beaten, we were worthy of the cause of Christ to be beaten. Oh, and they celebrated together. I wonder what real life would be for us as a believers if we stopped to notice the one. If we stop to notice the people around us, that God has strategic assignments, that it's more, than, it's more than just coming to church on Sunday, and this is good, and this church is vibrant, and it's alive, and it's growing. But think about the impact that we could have if every Sunday we came back to church. Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave, you got to see this. Man, this guy right here. Dude, how long have we been working with each other? Ten years? Dude, all of a sudden, man, like this, this week, I just said, man, you gotta, you, you got to read this scripture with me, man. Let's do a Bible study or something. And the guy's like, how did this, like, why did you ask? me today to do a Bible study. I don't know, but the whole time I've known you, I just felt like you've been searching out to God, and, and then all of a sudden, like, everything changed. He's like, he didn't know that I was praying today. God, give me a sign. Who knows what God's going to use in your life? You, you are a part of a beautiful symphony called the kingdom of God, and that symphony does not sound good unless everybody picks up their instrument and plays their part. The Bible says that we are a body, if, if one part lacks, the whole body lacks, and we need everyone to play their part, everybody to do their thing. If I could have the worship team come on up now. I remember the first time I, I had a holy interruption. Right after I had this spiritual awakening and this encounter with God, I was going back to normal life, and uh, I walked by uh, this coffee shop in Galt, and uh, I see the manager in there, and I hear the Holy Spirit say, go in there and pray for her. So I did what any good believer would do. I said, that's not the Lord. That's the devil trying to ruin me from taking care of the temple of the Holy Spirit. I got to get in there and work out in the gym, you know. I was, I was heading to the gym to go work out. And so I go in the gym and I work out. And as I'm walking by, and I'm all stinky and sweaty now. And all of a sudden I hear the Holy Spirit say, go pray again for that lady. I was like, oh, okay. All right. And I thought to myself, you know, I've looked like a fool for the enemy <laughs> for so many years. If I look like a fool for Jesus, that's okay. So I walk in. I walk into the coffee shop, and, uh, and I'm nervous. I'm not sure if I'm hearing God right, but I'm just like, God, you said, you know, that I would, you know, we would hear your voice, that your spirit's inside of us, and you would direct us. I'm thinking about all this stuff, and I've been reading the scriptures, and I'm just, so I walk up to this lady, and I go, excuse me, ma'am. This is going to sound weird, but I felt like God told me to come in here and pray for you. And she said, yeah, that's weird. All right. Tried. It's bad pizza. I don't know what it was. And then, like, in an instant, her countenance began to change. And these big crocodile tears just well up in her eyes. She begins to cry. And she says, what's weird is I've been having really bad headaches. I finally went to the doctor yesterday. And I found out that there's a tumor on the back of my brain after they did the scan. She goes, and I was so afraid. I haven't told my husband, and I haven't told my children. But this morning when I woke up, I cried out to God and said, God, if you're real, send somebody to pray for me. And here you are right now. That moment, I prayed. We both cried. We hugged each other. It was a, it was a, it was, it was a moment I'll never forget. I walk out of that at that coffee shop and, and again the Holy Spirit just encountered me in such a powerful way 
And he said, just, Jared, I'm looking for people that will say yes to my voice. And I was just like, God, I'll, I'll say yes to you no matter what the cost. I'll, know, I'll say yes. I'll step out of the boat. I'll step out of my comfort zone. I want to be a part of the kingdom that's advancing, that's seeing people healed, delivered, that are setting captives free. I want to be a part of that kingdom because following Jesus and being a Christian is not boring. It's part of being a radical community that goes out and influences culture. That's what we've been called to do as the church. Would you close your eyes for a moment? Side note, I was preaching in Galt last year, and this, uh, this lady walks up to me in between services and says, hey, Jared, do you remember me? I said, no, I don't. I'm sorry. And she said, I'm the lady you prayed for at the coffee shop. And I said, oh, my gosh, it worked. You're alive. <laughs> and uh, she goes, yeah, I'm alive. I'm not only alive, I'm, I'm healed. This lady is now a part of a Bible study uh, that my mom leads. And see, you never know what kind of part you're going to play in the kingdom of God. Who knows what would have happened if I would have said no that day. I don't know what would have happened, but I'll tell you something. You play a part. You are a part of a beautiful symphony. Pick up your instrument. It's time for the Holy Spirit to come and refresh us and awaken us to the reality that you are called to bring heaven to earth. And in 2,000 years ago, the Bible says when Jesus was getting baptized, the heavens were ripped open. It never said that they were closed. You live on an open heaven that God is releasing power right now.